But when we first began First Thessalonians several weeks ago, we considered that this is what theologians call an eschatological epistle. Eschatology being a branch of theology that deals with the uh, events of the end. And as we considered as we began we, this, this study, we saw that every chapter in First Thessalonians has a reference to the return of Jesus Christ. And that, of course, makes it very significant. As I have already mentioned several times, it was the first, believed to be the false, first of Paul's epistles. Martin Luther used to say that he had but two days on his calendar. He said today and that day. And of course, what he was referring to was uh, that uh, probably uh, greatest day in, in prophetic history, referring to the time when, of Jesus Christ's return that we all look to. That great day when the trumpet will be blown and Christ returns. And certainly uh, that should include us also, our lives. And we're going to see as we study First Thessalonians 4 that this bedrock truth that if we want to be prepared for that day, we have to consider very seriously what we do today, our Christian walk today. Every day we have to consider as we walk in the ways of God that this day certainly relates to that day and that we will never be in the resurrection if we do not walk a life worthy of pleasing God. And so for us, every day we get up in the morning, we begin our day, never knowing what the day may bring, never knowing if we will even be here tomorrow. This could be our last day. And we realize that uh, that day, the day of Christ's return, certainly relates very closely to what we do today, to walk a life worthy of pleasing God. You know, I've talked about Enoch a couple of years ago, how that that uh, he had this testimony that, that he lived a life to please God. You know, we can talk about truth. We can expound doctrines. Uh, we can uh, talk about the Sabbath and the Holy Days. Ralph and I were talking about the wave sheaf offering, of course, that uh, is a numbering device they used uh, to begin numbering the days to Pentecost. And, of course, we know the wave sheaf was a type, it was, it, it was a, a prophetic picture, a shadow of Jesus Christ, the being offered to God the Father. But certainly, you know, we can have the knowledge that we have. We can have the understanding of the holy days and the Sabbath, the commandments. But if we do not live a life of walking to please God and to obey God, it will mean nothing. I remember reading years ago of an uh, individual who found the Jesse James, James's old Bible. And he said it was a, a Bible that was marked up as it could be. Obviously, here was a man who studied the Bible, but yet it did not translate into his life uh, to make any type of change. You know, certainly the Apostle Paul talked about the danger of allowing that to happen to us because it, he really rebuked his own people here in the book of Romans. And he begins Romans 2 and verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Well, is that something, the secrets of men? I'm sure we all have them. Things that only God knows about us. Behold, you are called a Jew, and retest in the law, and make your boast of God, and know his will, and approve things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. This is Romans 2, verse 18. And are confident that you yourself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which you have the form of knowledge of the truth in the law. But then he asks this this probing question, you therefore which teach another, do you teach not yourself? You that preach a man should not steal, do you steal? 
You that say a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhorrest idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make your boast of the law through breaking the law, you dis dishonor you God. Dishonest you God, or he asked this in a question, a rhetorical question. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a really frightening consideration that, that our example could cause unconverted people to blaspheme the law of God. I can well remember when we've had church leaders that have gotten into uh, some type of horrific uh, sin that's become public, and it causes others to blaspheme God, you know, to say, well, you know, how can this, you call yourself God's church and these things happen? For circumcision verily profits if you keep the law, but if you be a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, the earth circumcision keep the righteousness of the law. Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you? Who by the letter and circumcision do you transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one inwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. And here's certainly a scripture that we should have in our spiritual memory banks. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So. We know that through circumcision, that we are circumcised in the heart, that God praises our life. It's not important what men think. I always like the uh, story of several individuals discussing which Bible translation they like. And one individual said, well, I like the NIV. It's easier to read. Other one said, I like the King James Bible. And another one said, I like my uh, uh, New American Standard. It's the most accurate according to the Greek text, but one individual in the story says, well, I like my mother's translation. And the question was, well, what is that? And he says, well, she translated it into life. And certainly, in God's church, you do see individuals who translate the Bible into life. And I have often said that oftentimes some of the greatest sermons that have been preached have not been sermons from the pulpit, but some of the greatest have been examples. Individuals who have preached great truth by their example. And Paul is saying in chapter 4, he's saying, translate what, translate what you believe into how you walk. In other words, according to a saying that's pretty popular today, has been the last 30 or 40 years, walk your talk. And essentially, that would be the title if you wanted to give this particular title, chapter a title, is Walk Your Talk. And Paul is encouraging us to do that. He says, chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1, Further, Furthermore, brethren, we then we beseech you. I mean, he, he is... His love for these, these people is causing him to strongly ask and to encourage and admonish them to do what he's going to be asking them to do and exhort you. You know, remember we talked about that word exhort, what it means in the Greek. You go over to uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter. We've read this so often, but just to remind ourselves what it means to exhort. And it tells us, Hebrews 10 and verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So that's unselfishness. And again, that word provoke strongly relates to uh, a cattle prod, just as you would prod someone, a cattle along, so as we too need to be prodded. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting, and the word there is parakaleo, one another, so much the more as you see the day approaching. For 
If we sin willfully, willfully, that means continuing in lifestyle of sin, um, even after we know the truth, not be willing to make the changes we need to make. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking of, of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Of course, as I mentioned, you know, that doesn't mean that uh, because we fail and we sin and we, well, we pit and we get back up and go on, that's not what that's talking about. It's talking about a person who willingly makes a decision to continue on in their lifestyle of sin. But Paul is saying to para kaleo one another. And the word there in the Greek, as we talked about, para, to the side, kaleo, called. It's a picture of an individual. We know, of course, that Christ and, and God the Father are there with us through their spirit to encourage us. I, I mentioned how this particular word closer, closer relates to parakletos, that the Holy Spirit is referred to back in the book of John. But you and I also, as vessels of his Holy Spirit, are called to parakaleo one another, to encourage or admonish or to exhort. As I mentioned, that particular word really uh, means not only to uh, encourage one another and that they've done good, they've done well, you can encourage someone that they're they made an improvement and they're growing, but you, it's also can be to admonish the individual to do better. You can do better. You can't stop where you're at. You can do better. And certainly I think God, we're going to see God's word encourages all of us that we can do better. And we should be encouraging one another to do that. And, and Paul is encouraging them. He's obviously, you realize this was a young church. And Paul looks at this young church and he sees they've made progress. They've done good works, but he said, you know, you can do better than you're doing. And so that's the encouragement that we have today. An exhortation to uh, do better. And so he does that. He says, we beseech you, brethren. I mean, he, because of Paul's love for them, he beseeches them very earnestly and exhort or encourage you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. He's talking about an abounding growth. About how that we would abound more and more with the love of God. And the day we quit striving to do better is the day we quit growing spiritually. You know, Michael... Uh, uh, is interested, he wants to become a physical trainer. And uh, I'm, I'm sure he knows because if you've been in a gym and weight trained, you know that you have to continually spur the, the trainees, the ones you're trying to help, to do better. And I've, I've noticed, uh, you know, when I, years when I went to a gym for, for a while, I've noticed uh, how much it helps to have a training buddy, someone to encourage you, you can you know, do another repetition, you can do better, you can you do a little, you know, we need that encouragement. But Paul, Paul has encouraged us that we would abound more and more. We know we're told that Philippians 4, verse 13, 4, 13, that, uh, you know, speaking of, we have to all know that we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. Though. What's, what's Christ's will that God gives us the power to be able to do uh, what he's called us to do? And I think certainly that is an important consideration that we have all the help that we need. You know, one of the most tremendous statements in the book of Philippians, Philippians 4, verse 13, Certainly as we approach Pentecost, as we consider the great help we have through Christ's Spirit, it says in verse 13, it says, For it is God which works in you both to will, and that is the desire. We have to have that. We have to have the desire. That's the desire that Christ instills within us to obey God. That's really the greatest power of the universe, the desire to please 
the Father. I mean, consider. That was the great power that Christ had indwelling within him, that he, he lived and he died to please the Father. And to do, not only, but he doesn't live, leave us helpless, but to do of his good pleasure. And preceding that, it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, that was John Wycliffe's favorite scripture because he grew up in the uh, church history with a time when individuals felt like they had to depend upon the organization, the uh, priesthood to be able to, uh, physical priesthood to be able to work out their salvation and confess your sins. And, but no, uh, we, we will see, we have a great part in our salvation. We're not helpless, there's things only you and I can do. <laughs> God's not going to do it for us. But he works within us to do the, for the will and to do, to have both. And Paul makes this statement over in Philippians. Tremendous statement here. I think so many times can give us so much help in our life. Because, you know, we, we go through situations in our life, we go through uh, perhaps different church, church organizations we've been in, we go through disappointments, we go through disappointments with ourselves. And Paul is saying in Philippians 3 and verse 13, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. He knew he wasn't there yet. But he says, but this, you know, this one thing I do, this, this singular pressing thing, he does. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And you know, it's a picture of a, of a runner that's running for the tape and he's stretching forth. And Paul is using that metaphor, that analogy to picture us racing for the kingdom of God. And oftentimes it not only involves forgetting our mistakes, but sometimes it also involves just resting on our past accomplishments. That we can't just look back and say, well, you know, I've accomplished this, I serve in the church, I've done this, I've done that. No, we have to, we have to be striving to do more to please God. Japanese have an acronym that motivates them in being industrious. It's called can I. Constant and never ending improvement. Can I? I remember a great runner, Jesse Owens, that uh, I thought about giving a sermon on him one day, but he was given a poem, I believe it was written by Robert Fro Frost, called Excelsior. That particular word means upwards and onwards. And you know, always striving to do better. And, and uh, Jesse Owens said that particular poem motivated him throughout his career. Upwards and onwards, going on to do better all the time. And that's, that's what we have to do. But we must walk the, our talk. We must be willing to walk a life that pleases God every day of our life and we can't be looking back. I remember years ago a man that came up uh, with the idea, he said, well the Levites retire at 50, so basically if you've served in the church, you retire at 50. No longer need to serve. Well, Paul kept serving way into his 60s. We can't allow that to stunt our growth. We, have, we can't rest in our laurels. We have to keep doing, doing more to, to please God. To abound more and more. And Paul says that you ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. You know, we're told in Romans, the eighth chapter, Romans eight, in verse one, where Paul encourages us, there is therefore now no condemnation to them 
which in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit that that's what we do day after day after day we walk to please God I, I was like the way a minister years ago paraphrase that he says there's no condemnation now to them who are trying I mean we may not do it perfect but we're still trying to live a life that causes us to please God to walk that way to not be men pleasers we're going to see to not be flesh pleasers we're going to see but to be God pleasers that's what Paul is talking about here. How you ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that something? Those who say that the Apostle Paul uh, taught the commandments didn't need to be kept. It's all grace. And you're going to see that he was a very practical individual. He believed in what you might call shoe leather theology, down where the rubber meets the road. And, and he, he believed that our walk had to back up our talk. He was a rabbi, and all rabbis had to have a trade. He was a man who worked. Uh, he was a man who gave, I don't, I don't think there's another individual except for Christ who gave any more than Paul. I mean, I, I look in to the New Testament, I, I can't see anybody that worked any harder than Paul. What, a, what an exemplar, what a role model he should be for us. He certainly had the Spirit of Christ motivating him. But he certainly never taught that the commandments were done away with. I mean, you, you turn over to the book of Ephesians. How, how can somebody ever possibly teach that? Here in Ephesians 6 and verse 1. He, he quotes the fifth commandment. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the earth. I mean, here he's quoting the fifth commandment and the promise. And then he ameliorates that a little bit here. He says, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. But bring them up with the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I well remember growing up in my family and sometimes how my dad's occasionally uh, could be pretty tough sometimes and it could cause to fire up within a young man a certain amount of resistance. But Paul is saying we need to soften up as parents but then our children need to honor their father and mother. So there's always Within God's Word, there's always this tension, this balance that needs to be there. And we get into problems and we get off and out of that balance. But certainly, we know Christ never taught the commandments were done away with. When he preached Christ's commandments, he, amongst those people, he was preaching what Christ taught, what Christ believed in what he died for. He tells us in Matthew 5 and verse 17. It is amazing that people do the exact opposite of this. And the very beginning of his ministry, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And the Greek word there, plero, Thayer says this makes, means to make, to fill up, to make full of meaning. And, and, and Christ came to make the law full of meaning to fill it full of meaning. He says, For verily I say unto you that till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But for whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So when I see former leaders of the church standing up and espousing that the Sabbath was done away with, I think right away, well, you're called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You may have the accolades and the approbation of people now. People say, no matter how brilliant and how learned he is. And, uh, but Christ says, no. He's the least in the kingdom of heaven. 
we're all familiar with this particular scripture. I certainly have it marked in my Bible. Isaiah 42 and verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. It means to bring it out into full view. Expose it to full view that we might, it might be magnified and made honorable. And people might understand how wonderful it is. So Paul did that. And he's reminding them here there in Thessalonica that they were to walk worthy. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And he says, for this is the will of God, that even your sanctification, that's we're sanctified, saint, holy. They're all very closely related, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. That you should abstain from fornication. Greek word there is porneia. You, know, you could do a tire, could do a tire sermon on that examining the different applications of the word, but, but essentially it's referring to any type of sexual relationship outside of marriage. It includes adultery, incest, uh, harlotry, any kind of all out, uh, uh, all unlawful sex outside of marriage. Now we know that of course we get our word pornography from that particular word. That's where it comes from. We used to, years ago, have a man who claimed the Bible did not forbid sex between two unmarried uh, individuals. He was wrong. Equivalent in the Old Testament is whoredom. Is whoredom. If you want to know what the equivalent in the Old Testament is, it's whoredom. You'll find an example of that over in Genesis, the uh, 38th chapter. Verse 24, speaking of this horrible situation that took place between Judah and its daughter-in-law. And it says in Genesis 38 and verse 24, it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burnt, because that was the penalty for whoredom, for harlotry. It tells us in Deuteronomy 22, Deuteronomy 22, and verse 21, speaking of whoredom, of fornication, then of this individual, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stone as she die because she has wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shall you put evil away from among you. Now why is Paul bringing this up to the, those in Thessalonica? Well, we know that uh, there was great sexual vice within the within the especially in the Greek Empire, in the Gentile Empire. We know, we studied there in Corinth about how Corinth had a, a temple there that there were, was actually, they had a thousand uh, temple prostitutes, that much of their religion, fertility religion was, was connected with that. And so, you know, when, when Paul, I don't think we have any understanding just of what a, what a, a, a vile, sinful people <laughs> these, they were. In many ways, perhaps they've trumped us, although it's kind of hard to imagine with all we see in our society. But I mean, they were guilty of every type of sexual vice, much some of which I don't want to mention. And Paul is saying, that can't be. He's saying that you have to walk your talk, you have to abstain from porneia. tells us in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Hebrews 13. In verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, 
in the bed defiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It's got two different categories here. So it doesn't refer to simply illicit relations, sexual relations between married individuals or where one is married. It's talking about, it's talking about individuals, any type of, of sexual sin outside of marriage. And Paul is saying, God will judge. It is a commandment to be taken very seriously. And he's bringing out that how important it is to know that, that God does judge our lives. This is not really light stuff at all. This is really gets down to decisions we have to make in, in our life. It's whether or not we're going to live to please God or not. And notice he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That means, you know, you and I have been given these physical human bodies. And Paul is saying that you have to exercise control of these bodies. You just can't, cannot, you have to, you have to enforce control on your bodies. One of the fruits of God's spirit is self-control. And Paul is saying, every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So we're given responsibility for that. We're told to work out our own salvation. So we have responsibility of how we do that. And anyway, it must be done. We have no other, no other alternative. We have some very, very... Uh, serious considerations we have to consider as God's people. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I will have to say I have known individuals in the church who have uh, married individuals outside the church even though they were converted and they married an individual outside who's not part and not a believer, and usually it just doesn't work out. There have been cases when it has, but usually most of the marriage is a very, very, probably the poorest form of evangelism. So, you know, if you haven't uh, can persuaded someone before you get married to accept the faith, your chances after you get married are going to be almost nil to none. And I know the individuals who have married individuals outside the faith and years later it falls apart and, and tragic sad things can happen. I remember a lady that years ago when I was long ago back in the 70s and she was a good friend of mine and when I first met her she told me how she would married outside the church and she began to express to me that great grief had difficulty and it caused her. It had not been easy. So we're encouraged to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness. I remember years ago, somebody's out of the mouth of babes. I had a man that wanted me to go in business with him. And he was hardworking and he was industrious, but uh, he wasn't the most honest person in the world. And I stopped to think about it. Well, should I go in business with him? Maybe we'd be able to make it work. And our, our son tells, uh, tells uh, uh, Jeanette, my wife, he says, well, what is this going to be like, going to business with Satan or something? <laughs> Just uh, out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> so and I thought, yeah, well, why would I want to go to business with this man? This would not be, it would not be a good thing. It's amazing what the real wisdom of our children could come up with. But we're not to have, you know, you get into yokes in business, you get into yokes I'm with unbelievers in marriage. I can't think of uh, worse, more stronger yokes or relationships. And what concord has Christ with Belial? That's another name for Satan. <laughs> so it was pretty correct right there. And what part has he that believes with infidel or an unbeliever? You know, excessively close relationships with people that can drag you down. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For, and, he, and he makes this telling, I mean, this tremendous statement. For you are the temple of the living God. You and I, 
Therefore, we have a responsibility. And God is telling us, look, I'm going to dwell in you. You better take it very seriously because I expect to be respected. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Boy, there's so much uncleanness in this world that we're not to be a part of and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And he goes on in chapter 7. Having, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's, that's what you and I are called to do. We're, we're called to take these bodies that God has given us, that he's chosen to dwell in us in, take it very seriously. That's what Paul is encouraging here. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, it says in verse 14, and God has both raised up by the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. You know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Of course, you know, Corinth, of course, as I mentioned, was a great, a great uh, uh, cesspool of sexual vice and immorality. But know you not that your bodies are members, are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. There's just something very grievous about sexual immorality. It hurts us. I sometimes grow weary of individuals saying, well, sin is sin. There's no difference. Sin is sin. Not necessarily. The Bible talks about grievous sin. Sure, all sin makes us worthy of death, but there are certain sins that are very grievous. And you see the grievous results of adultery within a marriage and, the, and what it causes and how it destroys the whole family. And Paul is saying, every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that committed fornication sins against his own body. You just do untelling damage to your relationship with God. For know you not that the, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you were brought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and your spirit, which are God's. Of course, we know we need to do everything we can to glorify in, our, in God in our body and to take care of what God has given us. So we must learn to control our human bodies. We have a responsibility in what we do. You know, I... Uh, when I was learning to tie flies, my instructor, well, the first things he taught us, he said, you know, you, you have to, you have to, because I, I tie uh, trout flies. I don't take real flies and tie them down or anything, but I tie trout flies on a hook. But it, it's difficult, because you, you know, you got big hands and you're up there with a, your hook and a vise and you're trying to tie these tiny little feathers and, and uh, uh, fur and thread onto this little hook. He says, you have to make a mental determination. You will, you can control, but you're going to control those materials. You're not going to let them control you. And what Paul is saying through God's spirit is we have this human body, this material, this flesh that he's given us to live, for God to live in, 
and uh, we're the temples of God and we have to make the determination that yes, we can control it. We can control these human bodies if we want to be in God's kingdom. You know, it tells us, you know, I mentioned this so many times over in the book of Romans, how it says that, it, how it gives us this promise here in verse Romans 8 and verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make it alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So the, the sobering part of that is, is that we have to make sure that we're living the kind of life where Christ is willing to dwell within us, where the Father is willing to dwell within us. Because if that dynamic doesn't happen, if we don't have the living Spirit of God living within us, we're not going to be resurrected. Continue, continuing. We are to possess His vessel, His sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence. Uh, concupiscence in the original Greek, epithomio, is a longing for what is forbidden. It's a longing for what is forbidden. Individuals uh, long for what is forbidden. You will recall, remember the story that uh, King Herod had John the Baptist uh, thrown into prison because uh, Herod told uh, John the Baptist told Herod he couldn't have uh, his brother's his brother's wife, and he became so angry because John told him that he couldn't lawfully have her that he had John thrown into prison. And we know the sad story of how Herodias' uh, daughter danced for Herod and uh, uh, pleased him, and the salacious. Uh, Despicable man, the most horrible men that you almost can ever read of. I mean, right up there with Hitler that had the babies there and murdered in Bethlehem. And all the horrible things he did. You know, he had John the Baptist beheaded. Greatest man, and Christ says that no man would have ever been greater than John. But certainly, here was a man who wanted what he couldn't have. In the Greek, it means a longing for what is forbidden. In the English, strong sexual desire. And he says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Now, we know, of course, that this, he says in any matter, this could be in in sexual manners as well as uh, other considerations as well. Of course, we know the uh, sixth commandment, do not steal. And certainly, uh, Paul could also have been talking about a, a person defrauding that brother by having any more relationships with his wife or perhaps an individual's future wife, which would be stealing from an individual as well, or a husband, go either way. We are not to defraud our brother. Every years ago we had, had a minister that people would repair things for him and he wouldn't, they'd buy parts for, for him, for his car and such considerations, he'd never pay him back. I mean, Paul says, no, that's, that's wrong. You don't have to defraud your brother. You don't have to take advantage of your brother. I remember one time, I was kind of, I'm just really taken aback. I couldn't believe, couldn't believe what I was hearing. There's two uh, brethren in the church. One of them was getting ready to sell a car, and I went out and I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm putting some stop leak in this uh, transmission so I can get it sold. He was going to s sell this car to some poor innocent guy that uh, thought he was getting a good car and that stop leak would be temporary relief and uh, temporary fix and later on the car would be leaking out of the transmission. I mean, God forbids that. We're not to defraud our brother 
in any way. It's just breaking the commandment, do not steal. Of course, we know that we are brethren as God's people. In a wider sense, all of mankind are our brothers. Someday, hopefully, most of them will be in God's kingdom. That's what we hope for. That's what God's will is. As many as could possibly be will be there. But God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You know, uncleanness can cover such a wide gamut of problems. I mean, uh, so many areas, unclean thoughts, unclean ways, unclean activities. He says, he therefore that despises, despises not man, but God who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. That doesn't sound like the Holy Spirit is a trinity, does it? He's given unto us his Holy Spirit. Now, we've talked about that before, about how in the Bible it's called the Spirit of the Father, it's called the Spirit of Christ, it's called the Spirit of the Lord, it's called one Spirit. But it's telling us, you and I, what we have to consider day after day, when we make our decisions as to how we're going to treat other people, conduct our lives, are we despising God? He says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves know or taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But notice what he says here again. But we, bese we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Continually growing. You know, the, the, you know the, the, what we have, and I have to, you know, it tells us be not weary of well-doing. As a minister, I know I can't look back and, and, and say, well, I've served God's people all these years. We can't love God too, and His people too much. We can't rest on what's been done in the past. We have to have that attitude of, of increasing more and more. That's what Paul did for us. That's, that was the role model he gave us. You know, it tells us in Galatians, Paul, the real danger, he says, you know, be not weary of well doing. It's easy to get weary and say, well, hey, I'm, I'm getting tired of serving. I'm getting tired of tired of having to sacrifice like this. I've done enough. Well, no. We can't do that. We're striving for that imperishable crown will be given at the resurrection, that reward. And he, he gives some pretty practical advice here because he understood there could be some real problems. Now, you, you look at the situation that Paul was dealing with, you read between the lines, obviously some of the people here thought because Christ was coming they could just kind of settle back and uh, uh, wait for Christ's return and not be responsible. And they were being busybodies. And it tells us, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business. In other words, he's telling us we shouldn't get, be the kind of people to get involved with uh, other people's business. I've even had people, I've had situations in the church dealing with people who didn't know the, the, all the factors and they get involved trying to be busy about it, trying to, trying to get involved in the decision that, that uh, I had to make. And it could be a real vexation. tells us, 1 Peter 4, verse 15, you know, this warning we have, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer but, or as a busy body, body in other men's matters. So people just have too much time on their hands. We're not to be that type of individual that we're getting involved in other people's business. Boy, I, I've known a situation, sadly, in the church where uh, a minister would get too close to someone and they'd be taking the minister's private affairs all over the church and those type of things. Paul is saying that just should not happen. The wives, 
my mother used to, uh, they used to babysit with some of the, with some of the ministers and uh, keep their houses, help, help, help keep their houses. People would ask uh, her mother private things and she, she wouldn't, wouldn't divulge it. Nobody's business. And Paul is saying, you know, don't be, don't be this way. Don't be a busybody. Tells us in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 13. He's talking about widows that shouldn't be taken in as widows that they would need to support because if they were too young, he says in verse 13, and with all they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also, busybody, speaking things which they ought not. So Paul is condemning this thing. You think Paul was a, a practical man? He was telling them, look, you people, you need to get back to living your life responsibly as you should. You need to, to do your own business, work with your own hands as we commanded you. And we know certainly He would say later on in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, he says, uh, for we hear that there are, he says, for even, even when we come with you, this we commanded you, that if you would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Yeah. You see, he's, Paul is a very practical man. I mean, he, he really was not only an evangelist, he was a pastor. He had to give them some very practical uh, shoe-leather advice because these people were not living their lives responsibly. And he says that you may be, walk honestly towards them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. But I would that, that and here we see, and I've mentioned how that, obviously there were individuals who did not understand. It's hard for us to, to really appreciate the knowledge we've been given about the resurrection, about God's truth. There were individuals who, had, who had, did not have the knowledge. They thought since Christ was, they thought would come in their time that some of their brethren had died and they missed the resurrection. And Paul is telling them, he, he's instructing them about the truth about the resurrection. As I've said, we take that for granted. We think, well, how could they think that? But they, did, they were thinking that. They thought, well, some of them obviously thought, Christ is coming in my day and some of my friends and brethren have died and, and they missed the resurrection. But he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. I, I uh, had to smile myself a little bit as I was getting the sermon ready because one of the commentators mentioned how that, that we're going to be, we're going to sleep in, in wakeful bliss. It doesn't say that. The Bible talks about death as sleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For with this we say unto you by the word of God, the Lord, that which we, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, and, and the Greek word there is proceed. We will not precede them which are asleep. He's encouraging them that, you well, know, your dead are going to have, the, your, your dead that have died in the Lord, they're going to have preeminence. They're going to rise first if you're still alive. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, <clears throat> and with the trump of God, where their archangel and, uh, uh, means a chief angel. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the Lord crowds to meet the Lord in the air. And then it says, as so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now we know, putting other prophecies together, that we're going to go with Christ uh, to the Mount of Olives where Christ will descend and the mountain will be split. There will be this great war between this world and Christ and his saints. But we will at that moment, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We will not be with Christ until that day. It says, we're for comfort. Moffat translated, encourage one another with, the, with, with these words. The importance we need to, to exercise in our life to encourage one another. Call one of the greatest responsibilities, one of the most noble gifts that we can give other people is encouragement. Of course, some have thought that and misunderstood some of what Paul taught about the, the resurrection because he makes the statement here in Philippians 1 and verse 23, for I am in a strait between two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. They read that scripture and they say, well, Christ, Paul is saying that uh, his desire was to go ahead and depart and die and be with Christ right at that moment. But Paul makes it very clear what he was talking about. It tells us in 2 Timothy 4. He gives the answer. This is the answer to that misunderstanding that people have when Paul said he had a desire to depart and to be with Christ. He says, First, Second Timothy 4 and verse 16, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. You know what that means in the Greek? It says, literally, I have agonized the agony. That's how he put it. I mean, well, everything Paul went through, he said, I have agonized the agony. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me when I die. No, at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. So clearly what Paul is talking about, that it would be at that day when he would receive his inheritance, the resurrection, receive that, that imperishable crown. So we see today that uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 really talks about what Martin Luther talked about of, of two days on his calendar is today and that day. That we are to walk with holiness today so that we can be worthy to live with Christ at that day when he does come again. And really, you could entitle 1 Thessalonians 4 I think it's very easy to see that Paul was just saying, if you want to boil it down, was walk your talk. Walk to please God.